a it's a beautiful day here in northern california but i've got about another hour before the sun goes down so i thought i would uh head out and get some exercise got my little ball over here that i sort of juggle as i walk um you know so i, I basically left california um right before the last national election and i knew that it would be uh problematic it was already divisive before the results came out extremely so and so here we are i'm back in the country again i've been back in the country on and off uh not very long but i'm now back in the country with another three months left to go to the next ele national election and so the idea here is whether or not the american experiment uh, has been proven false and that's probably not the case. There's not enough evidence to say that the American experiment has, has been disproven, even if we're already in a situation where nobody in their right mind would want to copy the system of government, the public education system, which is fragmented heavily. And it's just, by the way, on the, on the education side, just in this neighborhood, within five miles, we have, a, I think, two Catholic schools, uh, one school charging $20,000 uh, a year, this is a high school, by the way, uh, and a public school. And, you know, that's just within five miles of each other. And I also believe you have a bunch of charter schools as well, which are public schools, but under a different charter. Um, so we've got a fragmented educational system, uh, clearly a fragmented governmental system that nobody wants to copy. Uh, what's left, really? Um, we have a pretty good financial system. Um, you know, there's no way that we would not have a good financial system because this country has needed not one, but two multi-trillion dollar bailouts in the last 15 years, just to function. So that is something that people want to copy, but they probably can't. So the one thing that, and I'll tell you why they can't copy it. One bank, JP Morgan, uh, which rose to, and it was rose to international prominence after World War II, uh, because it was channeling payments from the uh, losers of World War II back into the, into the U.S. and was instrumental in perfecting the international, I think it's called IBS, International Bank of Settlements, IBS. Um, that bank, based on the, you know, a lot of the victories of World War II, you know, it, are responsible for a lot of the successes of America today. And a lot of the reasons that America is no longer is sort of um, what it wants to be, or what it claims to be, are because the structures post-World War II are falling apart. Now, so really out of all these things, you've got finance, education, government, you have technology. And I'm not necessarily somebody that thinks that technology is uh, something that ought to be lionized. Uh, Germany, of course, and the Nazis were number one in technology. Uh, and people seem to forget about that because the United States did attract a lot of scientists, um, but it was, again, it was Germany that kept winning across Europe because they were number one in math and science. And the reason that we don't know the, the names specifically of their scientists is because they lost. But of course, if you go back and study military history, they kept winning because they had the best technology, whether it was the U-boat, whatnot, and so on. So I'm not somebody that necessarily, you know, wants to emulate somebody else's somebody else's scientific or te technology system for many reasons. Um, but first of all, because it doesn't seem to produce uh, either a path forward, um, at least not in a meaningful way, um, but also because clearly you, you can spend a lot of money on, on any one thing. And today in the United States, a lot of that scientific research goes through the military. So what's happened in the U.S., which is, uh, at this point, in the top five in technology, what's happened in the, in the U.S. is because the United States is funneling all that scientific progress through the military. Um, what's happening is that there's a lack of auditing, a lack of fiscal discipline, which, thankfully, has not been completely catastrophic so far because, again, the financial system has been set up along with the insurance system in order to prevent failure, massive failure. So 
if you look across all these different things, and even in technology, Huawei, which is a Chinese company, uh, now sells more mobile phones than the United States. That's with the restrictions that the United States has, has, is trying to impose on China and Chinese companies. Uh, just this week, the president of the United States uh, decided that you know, he would force a sale of a Chinese social media company, which is really a data company, uh, to an American company. That's, by any other name, a confiscation of assets of a foreign country. And this is, of course, being done in the name of national security. So once again, you have that overlap between national security and technology, which is nothing new. So here we are, trying to sort of make sense of all these things. But the real question is, even though the financial sector is something that the United States should be proud of, even if we don't want necessarily to, em necessarily to emulate any other aspect of the country, certainly not the overall economic system, which is massively unequal, about I think 40% of the country lacks enough cash on hand to survive a month. Um, you know, if their income stops. That's one of the reasons that we will soon need another uh, multi-trillion dollar bailout uh, because the 40% of the country just doesn't have access to savings. So you don't want to you know, necessarily emulate that either. So overall, if, once again, we go back to the financial system being the number one aspect of the country. And that's something that what I just said is that people cannot emulate because one bank, J.P. Morgan, spends $9 billion a year on digital security. So if you're Panama or some other Guatemala, even Argentina, which has nuclear technology, you still can't keep up. So once again, that goes back to technology, that goes back to resources, and of course, that goes back to security. None of which means anything in the long run in and of itself because Germany was number one in math and science and it still managed to lose. Now, if you look at all these things in context, Germany today has a, has a political system that probably is worth emulating. And the reason it's worth emulating is because it's boring. It's completely dull. The Chancellor of Germany today is probably the polar opposite of Hitler. Uh, the Chancellor today is dull, not prone to great speeches, female, uh, just the opposite, an opposite in every possible way. And that's what politics is supposed to be on the national level. It's not supposed to be this sort of forum for fisticuffs, you know, where people, you know, argue about philosophical issues and divide and conquer each other and their communities based on issues like abortion and the death penalty and so on. Those are really areas that should have been delegated to the religious sector, the philosophical sector. And this is obviously something that the United States has failed to do. It's not something... Now, Germany, by the way, I believe they have a, a party called the Christian Democrats, but they don't have these sorts of problems, right? They don't argue about these things in the same way that the United States does. Partly because their system is specifically designed so that it's extremely dull. And as a result, it's probably something worth emulating. So in the US, one of the things that we look forward to in this upcoming election is what it all means for the American experiment. And it used to be that I thought that the United States, and I think most of us thought that the United States was an example simply because of its ability to incorporate immigrants. But, you know, that's also proving to be a problem, but it really shouldn't be. It's, it's the, the founding of the country was also diverse. You had, uh, you did have, a, appears to be a preponderance of Anglicans coming from England, but overall, you know, you had a lot of other people involved as well. Um, Jefferson was a deist. Uh, of course, Benjamin Franklin was a, uh, was a Quaker. I'm just passing this church right here. A minority sect as well. So overall, the founding, founding of the country was such that the Anglicans were gaining so much power that Madison, one of the founders, 
was concerned about the Baptists not having sufficient representation. And what he did was he de-established the Anglicans from the state legislature in Virginia. So in other words, when given a chance, as, as somebody who was, who was an Anglican, when given a chance to consolidate power, Madison, one of the founders of the country, went the other way. Uh, and that's not something we see today. If you want to argue that the American experiment is not working well today, part of the reason is because the country has ignored the lessons of its founders. Today, if, well today, the, the Democratic front runner is, is a man called Joe Biden. He's been in politics for decades. He's Catholic. In the city in San Jose, the police chief went to a Catholic high school. Again, these high schools now cost twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year. The mayor of the city went to a Catholic high school, and the majority of the board of supervisors for the county are also Catholic. So you clearly see once again the opposite of a lot of things that have happened in history. And once again, there's no one data point that shows success because Jefferson may have been quite guilty, conscious-wise, within his own conscience, about owning slaves, but he still did it. Even Madison, who was the most religious, I believe, I always get Madison, was it Hamilton? Sorry, Hamilton was the most religious. Uh, even he ended up marrying into a slave-owning family. Uh, so it was, but all of these people knew what they were doing was immoral. Jefferson has a famous quote about, I tremble before God when I think of what this institution uh, represents, which is slavery. They all knew what they were doing and they still did it anyway. So here today, in the run up to the election, what you see is fragmentation. But we had fragmentation back in the day. It didn't necessarily produce a country that was moral, but it produced one that laid the foundation for future generations to come in and succeed. And that, that's something that can't be argued with. Now, today, when I go online, very few people look, look at TV today. They typically get their news and their content from digital services, whether it's on the cell phone or, or on the laptop or some other place. Um, I know that there's somebody that's being promoted his name under the name, quote unquote, Killer Mike. Now, I'm sure he hasn't killed anybody. He just happens to look formidable. But I have no interest in listening to what somebody, a grown man named Killer Mike, has to say. So one of the problems here is that the American media machine, which is in part an educational machine, especially if the actual education system isn't working out very well, it's fragmented in a way that it's harming all the players. It's harming all the players because it's great at capturing your attention, but without imparting anything useful. And that's not the way it was supposed to be. So the way, we, if you go back and look at how things worked out, was that Madison specifically disenfranchised the Anglican Church within Virginia because he wanted the Baptists to come in. He wanted their input. And the, the idea behind government is that you're supposed to give a safe forum for people within your community to come in so that you don't end up with this kind of fragmentation, so that you don't end up losing philosophical ground to the private sector, which is really good at things like technology and so on, but not necessarily when it comes to things like discussions about politics and human rights and so on. So if you think about it, if this were a successful system today, it might look like Germany, actually. But in the US, what, with the political, political structure that I just described is clearly more homogenous to, than was intended. So you don't have this founding vision of this cauldron of competing ideas coming in and then ha either having people hash it out or being able to present themselves in a forum where the best ideas would be stolen or adapted within what's quote unquote a melting pot. So if you don't have that, then you just have sheer naked power. Now, what is also interesting is that this is something that future generations or people in other countries ought to be concerned about. 
is that when you don't end up co-opting minority viewpoints or other groups within society, you don't end up creating that forum within the political branch where they can be heard. You open yourself up to charges of discrimination, human rights violations, and so on. So that is something that nobody really taught us in school, that the idea behind government is to create this forum where things, where ideas would be hashed out and also where the majority would be able to steal ideas and ways of doing things, I shouldn't say steal, would be able to borrow or incorporate it into the patchwork of society and the culture. But it's still, that's the point. And when you look around, what is particularly interesting within this fragmented social media, media, propaganda, et cetera, educational system, is that you don't have necessarily a fragmented political system, right? You have the opposite of a fragmented political system. So those things seem, together, seem incompatible in the long run. But there's something else that people don't talk about, and that is prices. Um, one of the reasons that China will be is successful today and will be successful over the next 50 years is not because they're selling more mobile phones than anybody else, but because the cost of living is such just low enough so that the federal national government can single-handedly uh, effect change. And so when prices are low, you know, it's very easy for one thing or one billionaire or one group to change things and, or to force a U-turn. Part of that is just wages. When the prices are lower, you can pay for less. You can hire more people than you might otherwise need. Um, there's all kinds of reasons why lower prices make it easier to govern. Now, the problem when you have really high prices is that you don't get to move single entities, whether government or private, hedge fund or otherwise, they don't get to move the needle easily, if at all. So like I said, the United States, prices are quite high relative to the rest of the world. This bailout, this is basically a government, government sub sub subsidy program for Americans and businesses. It's going to cost, this is a second round, within one year. It's going to cost apparently about $3 trillion. So whether or not it moves the needle in a comprehensive or substantive way, I don't think it will. It simply reflects back what we just talked about earlier, which is the strength of the banking sector, which is of course tied to a lot of other things like insurance, the, um, one of the richest men in the country here called Warren Buffett, he made his money, and Charlie Munger, they made their money on insurance. So overall, what you realize as you're sort of studying the United States and trying to compare the country to other countries that work and other countries in the past is that prices make it higher prices make it harder to move the needle in any meaningful way. So what that means essentially is the status quo at some point becomes entrenched. So what happens at that point? That's what the Americans are gonna find out pretty soon, is what happens. Uh, because if you know, trillions of dollars are not gonna be enough to substantively change anything, well, either the United States is going to find out some other way of doing things, or it's going to go the way of every other empire in the world uh, that has become, that has not been able to make that U-turn. And when China at some point gets big enough, it will have the same problems, and it will too begin to decline. And in fact, the decline for China might be even more severe. Um, even today, I think property prices, real estate prices in China are going up too high, are going up too much, pricing out a lot of people. And the government is forced in China to prop up those prices in order to maintain social stability. But again, that's another uh, you know, issue because you know housing, along with a lot of housing policies and so on, 
uh, are something that the government uh, is acutely interested in because it forms, when we talk about the banking sector, you know, it forms a solid basis for loaning money. Um, if you have all, if your citizens have all their money and most of their money in cash, they can move it around. It's not really a stable foundation uh, for a banking system, for a stable banking system. But the foundations, the roots here, you know, this, this house behind me is very nice. Um, probably worth, at this point, a million dollars. Uh, we're in a very rich neighborhood. Um, this is an even more beautiful house over here. Oh, there we go. It's probably worth more than a million dollars. Now, if you're a bank, right, and you own a piece of that, probably. Um, and so because you've made the mortgage, you're getting interest on the mortgage. It's not something that's, you know, uh, ephemeral. It's something that's going to be around. They put, may have children. The children will own it or sell it. It'll go into the hands of somebody else, probably a, U a U.S. citizen. And there, thereby, you have that spinning flywheel that produces higher prices and therefore higher wealth in a, in a, what should be a sustainable way. And so the fragmentation that we talked about is also the consequence of a system where, by, by design, the United States intended to, intended to have fragment, fragment, uh, frag, fragmented private sectors as well as fragmented political sectors in order to steal the best ideas and to co-opt a lot of opposition movements. That's not the case in China. Uh, so, once again, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens uh, in the future. The other example of a country that's working out well, especially in terms of social, uh, housing policy, is Singapore. So, if you have lower wages and lower prices, one entity, entity can easily fix that or move the needle much more quickly either to make a U-turn or to forge, forge ahead quickly. But it's also the case if you, if you have a small country. Even with higher prices, uh, Singapore is probably one of the most successful countries in the world because, once again, you have a strong national government. Uh, so even if prices are high, they can move the needle fairly quickly. So what do you do under, under this whole experiment that's designed to incorporate minority viewpoints in a way that allows them to be co-opted or assimilated into the national framework while giving local entities the power to become small havens of experimentation. That's the design, especially where the private sector is concerned. Um, you can see that, first of all, one reason that things are failing is because you don't have actually political diversity. You have other kinds of, kinds of diversity, but not political diversity. That's a problem. It wasn't meant to be that way. It, it limits the ability to incorporate what we just talked about. And it also increases fragmentation. So rather than, rather than having forms that attract people from all over the, the country, you end up with people breaking off into private, darker places that are sometimes not accessible. The social media landscape is one of those examples on the abstract level. And the reason it's been so successful, in part, is because the government has failed, in the, in the U.S. especially, to maintain credibility. This sort of credible uh, voice, that not, has not always been the case. You know, once again, the framework, the, by design, was intended to have a clash that, here we go again, have a clash of different viewpoints that eventually created, pro created some sort of progress. And you can see that higher prices, as well as political uh, sameness, make it much harder to, to do those things over a large land mass, especially when the people within that large area are diverse. So, as we're three months away, the question becomes, did, did the Americans make the right choice? I would argue they did. The Hillary Clinton um, was certainly smarter and more competent, 
but she wasn't going to be, she had, she, there was no indication that she was going to change or reform all the issues that I just talked about, education, fragmentation, and so on. And so, given a chance or a choice between choosing someone who probably has a 0% chance of fixing all these problems in a country where only the banking sector and perhaps the science and technology sectors are worthy of emulation. If you've picked a crazy guy, there's at least more than a 0% chance or a 0.1% chance that there will be some changes. Here we are almost four years later, and part of the problem with the setup of the U.S. is that there actually haven't been changes. Um, the, a strong executive within this country is not able to make changes to all the deficient areas that I just mentioned. Education, I mean, practically everything except finance and science. So overall, one of the issues to be discussed is how those sectors will be reformed when they are designed precisely to be given local control and therefore a bit of exemption and safety from the whims of the national government. So that's something that has to be discussed regardless of, which, of who wins the next election. Because if you can elect somebody that is crazy and still have make no progress whatsoever on the trajectory of retirement spending, medical spending, um, educational achievement and spending, and political fragmentation. If you can do that and make no progress, and I mean no progress whatsoever, what you have is something similar to the trajectory of Germany in the past, where you had this alliance between technology, science, and the government that didn't work out very well. Now, China will continue to, to move forward because their system is designed to harness the scientific and technological advances in some ways uh, to government policy under either a 5, 10, or 20-year plan. Um, in the U.S. today, it's quite obvious that we have a situation where Technology is not a strong suit of the government. That's why that, that, that power is reflected in the fact that you now have four trillion dollar companies that are completely private and based on the recent congressional testimony, impervious to change or reform. Uh, of course, that's Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple. So you have all these published progress being made on the scientific side within the, within the U.S., within the U.S. on almost a purely private basis. And if people will argue that that's not true, once again, a lot of the scientific advancement happened because of government investment. The internet, for example, uh, came about because of, of a government institute called DARPA, which is under a military arm of the US. And the response to that would be that sh that's true, but <laughs> it was almost useless in terms of security because it was intended to be an open system. And that's why it's, it's been such an, an insecure system. And because it was an, an, an insecure system, it's created, created a lot of distrust, you know, among NATO members, especially when the U.S., which is in charge of a lot of that, a lot of the infrastructure, was using it to spy on other people, just like everyone else does. So it really has been the private sector in the U.S. that has taken something that's insecure and deeply flawed and tried to make it into something that was more secure and therefore usable. But the Chinese, of course, now probably don't have as many similar issues because once again, you have a national government that is involved in a lot of the advancements now um, across the country and, much, and is in a position to, uh, through policy changes, actually move the needle at least over the next 25 to 40, 50 years. So we have all these issues and the question really is what happens over the next three months? Now, the administration in power right now has signaled that it wants to make some changes. But as we just discussed, the system is designed 
so that no ch very few changes occur, especially within a country that's mired in debt from the top down, just as a way of life. So this debt, by the way, not has not been completely useless. I mean, when I've been walking around, you're looking at construction, right? These are these are fairly new. You know, this construction doesn't happen without debt, without financing, and so on. So you look at a lot of the areas that are ripe for reform. The question is, how do you make that happen? And I think that's something that we're all going to have to sort of figure out moving forward, regardless of who comes into, into power. Because once again, if it's Joe Biden, you're going to have a consolidation within the political system, within the political system that's not necessarily helpful uh, to making any sort of U-turn. If it's the other guy, and if the other guy wins by because people think that it's really the vice president. President Pence, who's running the show behind the scenes, and the actual president of the United States is, is just there to create a distraction by a biased media, thereby allowing the vice president to actually get things done. That's a potential way of looking at it. But again, the fact of the matter is there haven't been, you just don't have entitlement reform, you don't have educational reform. I mean, we went off over here. Oh. Oh, right. crossing the street there. Um, so you can see why centralized entities have been winners in, in the last hundred years, whether it's the Catholic Church, uh, whether it's China, whether it's Singapore. And you can also see why fragmented entities have been failing. And all of that probably does not require a solution uh, that's going to be handed down by fiat, it probably requires a community-based solution. And how we get there is probably the challenge that we have moving forward.